Great. Thank you, Clarissa. Clarissa, before we begin, do you have any announcements uh, for the group? Um, no announcements for the group other than um, just be mindful if you are uh, joining Zoom calls for the meeting later this month, please make sure to use the new invitation. I will remind in an email before then anyway. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I am really delighted uh, that um, Dr. Emmanuel Ratti has, is joining us today from the University of Bristol, um, UK, where he's a lecturer, which in this country means he's an assistant professor. Different terminology means different things in different spots. And his research and teaching is focused in ethics and philosophy of science and technology um, with a focus on biomedicine and data science. And we asked him here today to the Ancestry and Diversity Monthly Forum because he's done some interesting work on developing approaches to ethics-based auditing in medical AI. And uh, you can't read any newspaper, public magazine, uh, medical journal, anything anymore without seeing AI. And what goes along with that is there's two sides to that coin, right? One is the side of the technology that goes along with it. And then there's this whole issue about um, ethics um, and not to be lost on people. And so we think this is a great opportunity um, to hear from an investigator who's done some really um, significant work in developing what's called ethics-based auditing, which is different than what we typically think of um, and, and it's quite difficult. So he's going to uh, talk about this framework, I believe, for the ethics auditing and uh, point out where it can be worked and where it can't be worked. And then I think what's important for this group um, is also to think about what he's saying relative to how we need to think about it in terms of the ADWG and relative to ClinGen. For those of you who don't know ClinGen, is focused on uh, figuring out what we are doing with AI across the different grants, what we should be doing uh, in the research domain with respect to ClinGen, not with respect to our own individual grants. So we're delighted to have you today. Uh, we're gonna ask people to please hold their questions if they don't mind till the end of um, his talk, unless something is so confusing that you feel an immediate need to get clarification. And um, I think that because we often run out of time and we forget, right? You have a question right now and you forget when the end comes, please go ahead and put it in chat. Um, and then Clarissa at the end will help uh, moderate uh, that piece. So uh, Emmanuel, welcome. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation today. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daria. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. And um, so what I'm going to do uh, today is something a little bit more foundational than, than, than the themes you are used to in this particular setting. So I'll do what philosophers usually do. And, and in particular, I'll try to elucidate what I think is the best approach to ethical issues in artificial intelligence. And I'll apply and articulate my ideas, especially to the text of medicine and medical AI. So, um, I mean, you have been hearing a lot about, about AI ethics. Uh, for the past few years, and uh, it's becoming like this huge field that is taken to have this fundamental role uh, in shaping AI governance. And, um, and usually when it comes to governance, people have in mind two different things. So they distinguish between hard governance of artificial intelligence tools, which is the one provided by, uh, by hard regulations, and it's a system of rules enforced for institutions like governments, for instance, and, uh, and there is a lot of work to be done uh, here. Uh, you have been probably heard about the AI Act that has been, has been approved uh, very recently. And, um, and, and so also like in China, people have been doing a lot of these things in the US, maybe a little bit less. And, uh, but that's the art governance part. Then there is also a lot about soft governance, which soft governance is about the behavior that allows some degrees of flexibility or those behavior that those things that are done in the context of AI that are not covered by uh, by um, by art regulation and um, and ethics usually is intended to uh, use as a governance tools uh, both in the art governance and in the soft governance context so in the context of art governance it can be used as a foundation for regulations 
And after all, regulation, hard regulation laws are also shaped by ethical considerations or consideration on values, rights, duties, and so on. But ethics can also be used as a post-compliance governance tools. And it's about the flexibility and what ought to be done over and above existing regulations. And that's the kind of language that many corporations, many tech corporations have, 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 have been using in the absence of a strong regulation so far. So people say, well, we use ethics as sort of, let's say, self-regulatory uh, um, uh, considerations and so on. And uh, so it's an important role that ethics has, both in hard and soft regulation. And, um, but I mean, as a field, the AI ethics is still in its infancy and it has not like a clear identity, uh, both theoretically and, and, and practically. And, um, and so today I'm just going to say to focus on the soft, on the soft, on, on, the, on the role that ethics has in the, in the, in the soft regulatory um, regulation uh, um, uh, context. And, um, and in particular, I think that AI ethics, in order to, let's say, be a fully fledged uh, and a tool or let's say field must satisfy at least three conditions. So the first one is that ethics must provide concrete guidance on what practitioner must do, because of course you can say that, I mean, an AI tool should be beneficial, it shouldn't discriminate and things like that. But then of course, if you don't provide any, 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 any guidance, concrete guidance to practitioner on how to make sure that their tools are actually uh, uh, not discriminate or things like that, then of course, ethics becomes useless. At the same time, ethics must speak an interdisciplinary language because AI tools are never uh, developed in a vacuum, but they are always applied to different contexts. And in those contexts, people might speak different languages. Again, in the context of medical AI, you have the computer scientist or the data scientist on the one end or the software engineer versus I don't know, physicians that of course, they speak different languages. And also uh, the other thing is that ethics should not be thought as something that is on top of other things, but it's, it's, it's a practice that should also, let's say, allow people to cultivate certain good skills. And in particular, it should allow the cultivation of like ethical reflection, must facilitate ethical reflection and foster ethical deliberation. And, uh, and so far there have been, let's say, various proposal on, on the nature of AI ethics and uh, you probably heard of some of these like principalism, which is this idea that you have these high level principles like beneficence, non-maleficence, uh, respect for autonomy, uh, justice and explicability. And of course there is a lot of, let's say crosstalk between biomedical ethics and, and the AI ethics. But I think that it, they, I mean, as, as, a, as, a, as a framework, it doesn't provide, let's say concrete guidance of what practitioner must do because you, so, you, so if you say something like, well, the AI, uh, should not, let's say, discriminate again, or should respect autonomy, then you are not saying something, something particularly useful to, uh, to practitioner. And uh, also you have something like value sensitive design, which is very good at providing concrete guidance, but at the same time, it doesn't, let's say, facilitate ethical reflection. And there are some reasons for this, I will not enter into this. And then you have like the literature of fair machine learning, uh, which again, provide concrete guidance, but at the same time, it has some other problems. So, and um, in collaboration with a data scientist, Mark Graves, um, we are developing a new approach to AI ethics that is based on something that is called the capability approach. And, um, and we articulate our approach, especially in the context of medical AI. And, and we are trying, let's say, to, to see whether the capability approach can be used to, uh, uh, for uh, improving ethics-based auditing of AI tools in this particular context. And that's a pilot project that is funded it was like seed project funded by IBM and the Technology Ethics Center at the University of Notre Dame. And we are now like looking, we are now applying uh, for, for additional fundings as well. And, and today what I present are just preliminary results and, and conceptualization of this project. So in the plan for today is that given that we are proposing this new approach to AI ethics based on the capability approach, then first of all, I will tell you what the capability approach is. Uh, even though I'm pretty sure that, 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 that many of you are, let's say, familiar with that. And then I will try to explain the connection between artificial intelligence and the capability approach and why the capability approach is the best framework to tackle, let's say, ethical issues in the context of AI. And then I will provide a concrete example of how this works with the ethics based auditing in medical AI via the capability approach. Um, okay. 
So uh, let me start now with the capability approach. So the capability approach is a strategy um, to provide comparative quality of life assessment for theorizing about basic social justice. And in particular, it's used to um, evaluate the impact of social arrangement and policies on individuals. And, um, and it does so in a, in a flexible way and in a variety of contexts from policies uh, of affluent societies like Western societies to the ones designed for low and middle income countries. And, um, and the capability approach has been theorized in various ways, uh, starting from uh, Amartya Sen uh, initial formulation. And uh, here I will consider especially uh, Martha Nussbaum uh, formulation. Uh, why? Well, Martha Nussbaum is a philosopher, I'm a philosopher, we speak the same language, and that's how I got into the capability approach in the first place. And um, the cornerstone of the capability approach is that individuals um, um, not only should have uh, access to concrete positive resources, which is which are necessary, ne so necessary for improving their quality of life, but also, and that's a quotation, they should be able to make choices that matter to them. And uh, now, this idea that individuals should have access to the necessary positive resources and they should be able to make choices that matter to them has a lot of ramifications. And, and in particular, one is that our assessment of policies uh, or institution or systems should focus on what people are able to do and what people are able to be. And in um, particular attention should be on removing obstacles in, their li in, in individuals' lives so that they have more freedom to live the kind of life that they have reason to value, or, but also an aspect that can improve the freedom so it has also a positive spin. And, and from this basic uh, consideration, there is the fundamental distinction, which I see as the, the most important contribution of the capability approach to discussion about the quality of life and well-being. Uh, which is the one between the distinction between functionings and capabilities. And, um, and functionings are achievement or the various things that a person may value doing or being, like from being nourished um, or going to a restaurant, eating nice food or being able to participate in political activities or, or, or other things. And the most consequentialist theories measure life quality uh, only on the basis of function, so what people actually have. And, uh, but measuring life qualities only on the basis of achieved functioning is misleading because we should have, at least that's what the capability approach uh, uh, theorizer uh, proposed, um, we should also consider the freedom that an individual has in deciding what functioning to achieve and how. So the question to ask is not only what a person does, but what a person is able to do and what a person is able to be. And these things that a person is able to do and be are called capabilities. So they are defined as a range of potential functioning that are concretely feasible for a person to achieve and that one can freely choose to achieve. So it's a set of, and that's a quotation from Martha Nussbaum, a set of uh, usually interrelated opportunities to choose and to act. And, um, and so capabilities for this reason are also called substantial freedoms given the importance and the focus on choice and opportunities in which, and that's another quotation, people then may or may not exercise in action the choice is theirs. And, um, and these substantial freedoms have also a remarkable ethical dimension because they are conceived to provide a foundation for human dignity, at least in, in Martha Nussbaum uh, uh, formulation. And, um, and so uh, then the question is, so there is this big debate on which are the relevant capabilities because there are so many capabilities out there. And some of course might be very important, ethically relevant, others are not something that we want, let's say people to expand. For instance, I, there might be one may have like the capability of becoming a serial killer, but that's not the kind of capability that we want people to, to expand. And, um, and actually Amartya Sen is, is very, has been very reluctant at providing the list of, of capabilities. And the Martha Nussbaum nonetheless has provided this list of 10, uh, capabilities that she calls central capabilities. And, um, and according to her, the task of a government is to ensure and secure to all citizens at least a threshold of these 10 central capabilities. And I mean, it's not exactly clear what she means by threshold, but, but that's the idea. So we have like life, bodily health, integrity, sense, imagination of thought, emotion, practical reason, affiliation, and so on and so forth. And, um, but whether functioning 
is effectively possible and can be realized in the way one sees fit. So whether one really has the capability, it depends on what are called in these literature conversion factors, which are those factors that allow a person to turn a possibility into something actual. And so for instance, there are personal conversion factors like I don't know, metabolism or physical condition or reading skills. And uh, there are also social conversion factors like public policies, social norms, discriminating practices, gender roles, societal hierarchies, and so on. And then there are environmental conversion factors, which are like climate or geographical location, which are very important to me. And uh, Martin Usman referred to the sum of these things. So the, the, so, the, so the actual capabilities and the conversion factor as the combined capabilities. And, um, and in order to understand the connection between conversion factors and capabilities, I consider a fictional, but I think realistic example. So imagine a policy which makes mandatory for young boys and girls to go to school until they are 18, okay? And the policy goal can be formulated in terms of the expansion of capabilities. So exp to expand, let's say, the senses, imagination, and thoughts of young people, or to, uh, to expand the practical reason of young individuals, or their affiliation, their, their, so the social networks, and so on. But whether the policy is actually successful in expanding those capabilities for individuals so that they can turn these possibilities into functioning, then will depend on conversion factors. For instance, there might be social norms in certain neighborhoods that do not see in a favorable light young girls going to school until they are 18. So young girls then will not be able to go to school even if there is the policy that makes mandatory this. Or in certain areas, there might be geographical obstacles to school access in the first place, okay? So that even if the policy makes mandatory to go to school, you will not go to school. And, um, and so because of the presence of the certain social and environmental factors, which result in the lack of the right social and environmental conversion factors, then the policy might not expand capabilities in the way policy makers, for instance, envision. And um, so that's the idea that you have resources and then, um, then you have like the combined capabilities and then the combined capabilities are exercised so that one choose which kind of functioning to realize. And there are two arrows here for conversion factors. The first is between resources and capabilities because something is indeed a resource if it can be used if it can be used to be transformed into a function. And uh, if, the, if there is not that factor, then there is no resource. I mean, no resource is not seen as a resource in the first place. And the second is that conversion factors are in the constitutive part of the combined capabilities as Martin Osman says. And um, so then because AI is a kind of technology, then it is important to understand the relation between technology, capabilities, and conversion factors. And I mean, intuitively, technology should be important for capabilities, given that artifact in many cases expand the range of things we can do or perceive. And so, I mean, the obvious connection is this, technology expand capabilities. So think about a typical example done in the, in the capabilities literature, a bicycle. So a bicycle is a technological artifact um, that, can be used to expand certain capabilities, the capabilities of affiliation or sense, imagination, and thought, because maybe you are going like in the countryside and see like some beautiful, let's say, sightseeing or things like that. And um, however, the problem is that a technology like bicycle, like a bicycle, will expand those capabilities only when it is in the right relation with other constitutive elements of the combined capabilities, which are basically the conversion factors. And uh, again, consider the example of bicycles, they surely expand some capabilities. And these capabilities are expanding, especially if you are in countries that are bicycle friendly, like the Netherlands, where you have uh, um, an infrastructure that can facilitate the, the movement of bicycles themselves. While in other cases, like for instance, if you are in the desert, then you don't have anything like that. So a bicycle is completely useless and will not expand the capabilities at all, okay? So that's like the first idea again, like the connection between the technology and conversion factors. And um, then the technology also is very important because they can shape the very socio-technical system in which we are embedded. And that of course has downstream effect on other capabilities, like for instance, information and communication technology have changed healthcare institution and practices. And um, so then these 
well, like the capability approach and the capability in the technology, but what about the particular technology that is artificial intelligence? So what is the connection between the capability approach and AI more concretely? Well, what I argue is that the capability approach is the right theory of the good that we can use to provide the foundation to AI ethics and also to operationalize ethics even better so that you have basically provide concrete guidance to practitioners. And in particular, I want to emphasize two points. So the first one is that the capability approach uh, will tell us what is the ethics in AI ethics, because people talk a lot about AI ethics, but then, I mean, they are surprisingly vague and ambiguous in, in saying what is the ethics here, okay? And um, so, and the capabilities or the capability approach, they impinge on ethics profoundly. So they are substantial freedoms, and as such, they are strictly connected to our own conception of how we ought to live our own lives, to have our own conception of the good life and of the good. And ethics is about how we envision the good life in the first place. And, um, and the idea is that, is that AI tools uh, impact those substantial freedoms that are capabilities by structuring and constraining the way humans interact, the way humans act, and what they can possibly achieve. And as such, they impact the substantial freedom and our perception of our own substantial freedoms. And they do this at a very large scale. And, and the important thing is that in many cases, AI tools do this in an invisible way and uh, as a background technology that restructure our own environment. And uh, for instance, AI tools can shape social media platform in a way that feed us with content or stimuli that mold our own personalities making us more narcissistic or more empathic in a way that also change how we perceive we, we, we communicate with other people or the kind of relationship we can have with other people, okay? And, but the point is, because of the scale and their invisibility, AI tools shape our own capabilities. And it can be for the best because they can expand the capabilities, but they can be also for the worst because they can restrict them, okay? And, but even when they expand capabilities, and so they are not doing anything immoral, they still have an ethical impact because they impact our own, our own, um, uh, our own lives, okay? And um, the second thing is that the capability approach is also providing like a guide to establish when AI systems are malfunctioning ethically or when there is what people call value misalignment. And, um, and the idea uh, intuitively simple is that AI tools are ethically problematic when they are restricting one of the central capabilities uh, that Martha Nussbaum uh, uh, list. And so the idea is that we should be able to anticipate or measure the impact on capabilities on users or subjects. And, um, but the problem is that how do we identify the impact? How do we anticipate the impact in the first place? Well, our idea is that, well, you have to look at the conversion factors that end users must have to benefit from the AI tool in the first place. And then you'll get an idea of who is excluded and who is not, who is benefiting from the AI tool and who is not. And I mean, consider this famous case that was much discussed a few years ago, uh, which is like really like an exemplary of, of, of this. And um, so, um, so Obermeier and colleagues, they analyzed the prediction made by a widely used health risk algorithm that falsely concluded black patients were healthier than equally sick white patients. And though the race blind algorithm appear well calibrated across races, uh, or at least that's what I remember. And among the many problems, what emerged uh, was that the algorithm used health expenditure as a proxy for health risk. And so the algorithm awesome. appear fair with respect to healthcare expenditure, but not actually with respect to yeah. meeting healthcare needs. And okay. For a week. I, uh... Hello? Okay. And um, so, and it is reasonable to think about health expenditure as a proxy for this, right? And so the more a person spends on health, the more this person is likely to experience health-related problem, at least usually. And um, however, it will be a proxy only for those individuals who already have access to healthcare in the first place, where healthcare access is a conversion factors that facilitate the expansion of the health capability. And also depends on other conversion factors, like having a full-time job, uh, healthcare insurance, uh, stable income, and also like living in an area where healthcare is accessible because there might be uh, areas where, where it is not. So in other words, 
the algorithm was performing well only for those individuals who have certain conversion factor in place. And therefore the health capability was expanded only for those where the combined capabilities included specific conversion factors implicitly assumed in the design of the algorithm. And um, so the idea is that AI practitioners have assumed, at least implicitly, that all end users had an homogeneous level of conversion factors. However, with this controversial assumption, they automatically exclude and make invisible all those who lack that particular level of conversion factors, thereby restricting their cap uh, capability and then down the road, other capabilities as well, given the connection between F capability and other capabilities. So then through the lens of capabilities, what we are saying is that AI ethics become the investigation of the impact of AI tools on Martha Nussbaum central capabilities. And in particular, there are three steps or three questions that need to be answered by any ethical analysis of AI tools. The first one is which capability um, uh, the AI has promised to expand. And AI tools are usually advertised or described as being designed to be beneficial in some ways to users. And in some cases, that benefit can be easily spelled out in terms of the expansion of central capabilities. And this happens when the AI tools bears directly to the functioning related to the important capabilities such as health uh, or control over one material environment in cases when you have AI tools that are used to decide on who should get a mortgage or a loan or things like that. And, uh, but even when the benefits are not obviously related to a central capability, then the context usually can provide indication of which central capability might be impacted. So if it is an AI tool used in the context of education, then the central capabilities impacted can potentially be the ones most related to education. But pointing to capability is not enough. Methodologically, something more is needed. We know that technology can expand the capability only when the right conversion factors are in place. So if the conversion factors are not there, then the technology will not expand any capability. Again, think about the example of the bicycle used in the Netherlands versus used in the desert. So therefore, Two other questions will complete an ethical analysis of AI tools. The first one is, uh, which conversion factor should AI practitioner, um, so, so, uh, sorry, uh, what configuration of conversion factors a users must have in order to benefit from the AI tool? So that have the capability X expanded. And here, uh, this question can be answered by means of a philosophical and sociological investigation. And then the third one is, uh, how data on conversion factors are computationally modeled and processed, and that's the technical investigation. And the idea is that given one, uh, two, and three, one can reasonably anticipate the impact of AI tools on central capabilities. And, um, and so this is like the idea of, of the framework for AI tools in any context. But then, of course, one has to narrow it down to specific contexts, and that's what I'm going to do in the next, in the next section with the case of in the case of ethics-based auditing in medical AI. So, I mean, before, let's say, going to the way we see ethics-based auditing in medical AI through the lens of capability, maybe some of you are not familiar with the idea of ethics-based auditing in the first place, so I'm just going to say a few things about this. And, uh, well, first of all, auditing is typically defined as a systematic process where you gather information or evidence about how a system functions, and then you communicate results to various stakeholders. And so you provide an evaluation of such a system from a particular perspective, okay? And, um, and um, so, and usually like the system functionality is understood in comparison to some claims that designers have made about its functionality in the first place, okay? So what, what, the, what, the, what the system is supposed to do. And um, there can be like, there can be done many distinction within auditing processes. You can have internal versus external auditing processes. Uh, there are mere compliance audit, which provide a measure of how a system comply with an explicit regulation, or there are risk, risk audits, which are not necessarily about risk, uh, but they are developed around more open-ended questions. So I don't know why also the ones that are not really related to risk are called risk-based, but I don't know. That's, so that's the way it is. And you have also like impact audits, um, which, um, uh, oh, well, you, you have also like, in, so specifically in, in, so in artificial intelligence, you have, um, you have like 
um, auditing that encompass the functionality, so the rationale underpinning the system and its purposes, or uh, that, they, that they audit the model, so the source code or how the model is developed, and then also uh, impact audits, which are like mostly the type, severity, and effect to individual groups and environment, which is usually done, let's say, post hoc. And um, so ethics-based auditing, EBA, is a type of auditing AI tools by looking at the ethical dimension of these tools. So the idea is that, well, you investigate some characteristic of AI tools, their behavior under different circumstances, and then you conclude whether the tool is compliant with a set of ethical principles or values. And, uh, and that's something that is people have been doing like for a while now, for a few years. And, um, and in addition also there is, especially for the internal audits, there is also this goal of stimulating a discussion on a pro-ethical design, okay? So that ethics is not just what comes after, but then it's something that is part and parcel of developing AI tools in the first place. And, um, and usually ethics-based auditing uh, fall under the category of risk-based because even though, of course, there is the, the issue of compliance with certain values, uh, the alignment is usually less straightforward for some problems that I have uh, mentioned at the beginning of this talk. So one may need to ask more open-ended questions about how our system works, for instance. And, um, and EBA can be external and internal, and we focus especially on, on, on internal uh, EBA because they are the one that are useful tools for stimulating ethical reflection and awareness within an AI team. And, um, and the ethics-based auditing, they include aspect of functionality audits because they investigate whether the system really captured the rationale of, of the claim, so, so, the, so they claim the rationale. And it's also oriented towards understanding the model as well as the impact as a result of looking for a set model output. And, uh, and there is a lot of work on impact related to risk, harm, bias, and discrimination. And this is usually like very good. And, but usually it's done in this, let's say, context of uh, principalism or fair machine learning approach to uh, EBAs that falls under the same traps of this approach to AI ethics in general, as I mentioned at the beginning. And, um, and so, that's why we conceptualize and operationalize uh, ethics-based auditing in terms of the capability um, uh, approach. So the idea is that ethics-based auditing will investigate the impact on capabilities as a result of functionality and model auditing, and also part of impact auditing. And uh, is usually, let's say, uh, uh, guided by two questions. And um, so the first one is which capability the artificial intelligence is supposed to expand. And then the second question is how do we measure or at least identify the impact of algorithmic systems on capabilities or anticipate it? And concerning, let's say the first question, I mean, if we are, for instance, in the context of medical AI, then of course the focus on health as a capability, uh, it will be like uh, primary, okay? And, um, so, and then the idea is that, well, we focus on health as a capability and then how health capability can affect other capabilities as well. And so just let's say to go a little bit more in depth into this uh, um, uh, auditing of, of medical AI tools, then how we should conceptualize health as a capability in the first place. Well, Martha Nussbaum call it like bodily health, though she, she also want, let's say the mental dimension to be covered somehow. And it's usually defined in terms of functioning rather than the capability proper. And, um, and the similar characterization comes also from this other book uh, by, by Venkat so Rapuram. And he calls, he calls the, cap the health capability as the capability to be healthy. And, um, and at least is seen instrumentally as contributed to the other central capabilities rather than being per se capability, okay? And, um, but I mean, very interestingly, uh, there have been works in health economics by Jennifer Prarroger and their group that have provided a more in-depth characterization of what F capability is. And, uh, and in particular, she distinguished between F functioning and F agency. So um, F agency is defined as individual's ability to achieve health related goals or functioning that people value in a way that they act as agents of their own health, while the health functioning is the actual health outcome resulting from action permitted by the F agency. And, um, and so basically we can define F, capa F capability as the opportunity to exercise personal responsibility 
in health-related matters. So when we are ethics-based auditing uh, a medical AI tool, uh, we should especially, let's say, uh, see whether they expand capability understood in health capability understood in this particular in this particular way. And then the second issue to address is uh, the conceptual investigation of how we anticipate, measure, or identify an impact on health as a capability, uh, or what are the factors that most impact something like like health agency. And again, like the answer lies in the structure of combined capabilities. So without certain conversion factors, a capability cannot just be expanded, okay? It cannot be done. And um, so in this case, uh, we can think about the capability as something that can be broken down into causal components of individual characteristic needs and external conditions. And um, for instance, like individual health capability, uh, Praruja uh, says, um, uh, depend on how external and internal circumstances add or detract from an individual. So in order to investigate the impact on health capability, or as she called it, health capability profile, we need to do research about the interaction between individuals and various connection factors. And in particular, so it requires understanding which configuration of conversion factors end users must have to benefit uh, from the audited AI tools in such a way that health capability is expanded. And, uh, and if you take like the case of Obermeier and colleagues mentioned uh, before, the configuration of conversion factors is the one that allow end user to have healthcare access in the American context. And, um, and so these are, for instance, like concretely uh, conversion, uh, conversion factors. And um, sorry, just one second. Um, so these are just, let's say, some of the things that, that Jennifer Parruger uh, mentioned. So you can see that there are like internal factors like health status or health functioning. Health knowledge is also important or have self-knowledge about, about matter of health. But there are also like external factors like social norms, like social networks and social capital and so on and so forth. And then again, she provided a very rich description of how these conversion factors then add or detract from uh, health, uh, uh, health agency or health capabilities. And um, so now the question is, how do we anticipate the impact uh, that AI tools can have on capabilities concretely? How do we do this? And so consider like a fictional case. So consider like a case of a company trying to improve health outcomes by delivering customized nutritional meals to patients with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So the company then would work with payers and providers to use AI to select patients and meal programs for uh, meal delivery. And of course, an external audit might look at clinical improvements and whether there are discrepancies across socioeconomic class, genders, or ethnic groups, it will be done, let's say, post hoc. But then an internal audit might be even, let's say, more useful because we look into the specificity of the tool to anticipate any systematic exclusion, which may possibly restrict health capability. And, um, and so that's the kind of structure of the auditing process, of the internal auditing process that they re envision for cases like this. So in the first step, after the initial preliminary development of an AI tool, a prototype, then AI practitioners are asked to compile a detailed document on how uh, they have built the tool. And this will follow a specific, let's say, pipeline that I will talk about in a second. And it may include also other standardized documents like data sheets or model cards, okay? Then in the second step, this documentation um, is analyzed and because documents, uh, like this one can be, let's say, very long, detailed and plenty of details that might not be relevant uh, to capabilities, then we envision the development of, of a prototype at which Mark Graves is working on it that can be used to flag in the documentation relevant loci where the way the system has been built deal with data about conversion factor or presuppositions about conversion factors. And I mean, information retrieval and, and, and NLP techniques can identify locations in the document. And uh, for this, the internal audit, of course, defines the terms and other descriptors relevant for the capability audit in collaboration with other experts. And the tool then identify locations in, in the main and supplementary document, documents where those terms and description occur. And, um, and I mean, in the way, for instance, also Mark Gray see this, using an AI tool in the audit of other AI tools support efficient audit of large complex development projects, which again, can have like very, very long documentation. Then in the third step, the results are presented to relevant internal auditors. Uh, there is a trend 
in recent literature to promote, to promote interdisciplinary, to, in, interdisciplinary and participatory design of AI tools. And uh, our uh, ethics-based auditing structure is interdisciplinary in nature because internal auditors should be either ethicists or social scientists or both, ideally. And um, internal auditors then will analyze the results provided in the second phase and they will integrate this with the conceptual investigation about conversion factors required for the AI tool to expand the capabilities in the first place. In this phase, uh, tools for fair machine learning can also be used to get an understanding of how specific groups are potentially excluded by the tool um, and so on. And then finally, uh, all internal auditors discuss the result of the analysis with practitioner uh, with the aim of modifying the design uh, of the algorithmic system to make it more beneficial uh, to capabilities or to the expansion of capabilities. So I'm just, let's say, to, to give you more details on this, I'm going to show you how one and four might work for the case at hand. Again, like a fictional case, but we think like realistic. And, um, and so first of all, I'm going to show you like what kind of information we need to go in the detail document. So imagine that this is like the pipeline to build uh, an artificial intelligence tool in the, in the medical context, like the one uh, for, 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 for diabetic pa uh, patients. And uh, ideally people, let's say, will go to, uh, through all these phases in an iterative way to build the AI tool in the first place. And so they will maybe write down a documentation saying what they have done in all these phases. And, um, and so um, um, let's start with, for instance, the first phase, like the problem understanding and definition, what, what they will, so we'll have to write about. So one question is, how the problem that the AI tool is supposed to tackle is formulated in the first place. And for instance, one may ask, what is the goal of the system and whether this goal can be translated quite easily into something about health agency. So in our case, the goal would be to improve access to nutrition of food among diabetes patients that need it, okay? And, um, and of course, in this case, it's something that definitely expands the capabilities. Then the second phase is, uh, is, so the, um, is the stage of data acquisition. And um, first of all, information must be gathered about which variables or features of electronic health records contains in the first place, and how these are related to conversion factors. So for instance, what information doctor's notes contain, or how do features of data are useful to understand the personal, social, and environmental factors of data subjects, or like containing information about where they live, employment, their likely income, their self-knowledge, their health self-knowledge, and, um, and also very important is the quality of data that people have been using to train this algorithm. So just like to make like one quick example. So in selecting a structured electronic health records, one might select only data that is exported cleanly from an electronic medical records for a matter of convenience because it's like data that are easily, let's say, to process. And so exclude data set that requires uh, optical character recognition, OCR, uh, of scan or fax document. However, if the OCR document predominantly comes from small clinic in underserved neighborhoods where conversion factors could significantly different from those receiving care in, 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 in the, let's say, uh, uh, kind of say upper class uh, uh, neighborhoods, then superficially skipping OCR data will mean excluding them from the big data loop, for instance. And that, of course, is something that should be specified what kind of data people have been dealing with and why. And um, because of course being excluded from the loop means that no one will notice the particular condition or lack of healthcare affect in specific areas, which then will become increasingly uh, invisible. And then the first stage is continuous with the second and it is data understanding and preparation. The typical case is the strategy of handling missing data, usually divided into missing completely random, missing at random and missing not at random. And to measure the effect of the intervention, one might choose participants who regularly have fasting glucose tolerant test result, as changing in those results could indicate whether the intervention affected blood sugar, for instance. And this is relevant to conversion factors, as we will see. Then you have in the phase of data analysis and modeling, there is a lot to pay attention to, especially how conversion factors are hidden or made silent by modeling strategies like using simple descriptive statistics or machine learning models, which then affect how people may interact with such a system in the future. And um, any model validation interpretation, one compares model output to independent observation to judge whether the model is performing as expected. And this often combines with tuning the model to uh, maximize some measurement, like accuracy or balancing some trade-off, like the precision record trade-off. 
And um, choosing the appropriate metric as an ethical dimension that is often overlooked. For instance, like in medical diagnosis, one chooses metrics to minimize false positive with non-threatening disease and costly follow-up and to minimize false negative with effective early treatment of serious or contagious disease. And, uh, and minimizing one or the other is a choice that impacts significant health agency. So it's something that people should specify in the documentation. And these are more or less the kind of... Now, then once you have this document and you have the, uh, the prototype that analyzes the thing and then the results are, 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 are presented to the internal auditors, then there is the last phase, which is the phase of, let's say, where the internal auditors discuss the result with the practitioner, with the people who have constructed it to, to the system in the first place. So what kind of discussion people will have, okay? It would be something like a workshop, of course. And, um, and the discussion, again, there will be a lot of brainstorm about the result. And I mean, and this would be something like, in the case of like discussing the problem, understanding and definition, one may discuss how the goal of the system has been formulated with respect to capabilities in the first place. So having access to nutritional food is indeed something that can possibly expand health agency, but if the successful intervention is measured in terms of, I don't know, self glucose test that people with diabetes would have to take, then maybe we are assuming a certain level of health self-knowledge, which is a conversion factors that few people have. Or in the case of the OCR versus the clean data, auditors and data scientists may discuss if there are differences in the two kinds of data uh, with respect to environmental conversion factors, such as facilities, resources of neighborhoods, social security of the macro social environment, presence of barriers to health facilities, general effectiveness of, this, of those facilities and so on. And in the case of missing data, one can discuss if it is a matter of healthcare access, whether some data are missing and consider the factors that would affect such access. Discussion can be about things like, even though some participant glucose tests may not obviously missing, if they have less frequent testing due to other health conditions, or unrecognized social factors such as healthcare access or financial constraint, they could be excluded from the intervention due to the same underlying reason that reduce their access to nutritional food, to nutritious food in the first place. So deciding whether something is missing at random or not may be connected to our understanding of conversion factors. And um, so, and this would be, let's say, the, uh, the, the most, let's say, participatory uh, interdisciplinary part of the audits and it can foster like an inclusive design of algorithmic system that can bring benefits to capabilities expansion. So to sum up and conclude, uh, I've argued that the capability approach is the best framework to conceptualize and operationalize AI ethics. And I've shown that um, the benefits of the capability uh, approach in the context of internal based auditing of so medical AI tools our ethics-based auditing framework is in four phases, and it really provides concrete guidance to practitioner. It is also interdisciplinary because then it also like run these, these stakeholders uh, 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 workshop, and then it also foster ethical reflection, especially in the last phase. And um, so this is everything that I have for today. And um, if you want to contact me for comments or for collaboration, just this is my, my contact. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Eddy. We, that was a fantastic talk. Um, I see we have so far one question in the chat. If other people, and we have Anna's also raised hands. Um, go, go with Anna. She had her hand up earlier. All right, Anna, go ahead. Oh, hello. Thank you for an excellent yeah. talk. Um, I was hoping you would say more about the limitations in your view of the values-based approach because this is the dominant approach that we've seen, um, of course, throughout the literature. And uh, what I'm particularly interested in is it seems to me like what you're presenting is an excellent yes. kind of specification of the value of beneficence. And it seems that to really integrate equity and justice concerns, that's actually kind of a, a thing that doesn't sit very naturally within your framework and has to be wrapped around it. And also other things we might care about, including some things in the transparency realm, including some things in the environmental justice realm, don't seem to naturally, to my eyes at least, fit naturally within your framework, uh, whereas they would within a values-based framework. So. Yes. So um, uh, so there are actually, let's say, two, um, two different frameworks that I see as 
well, I wouldn't say competitors of mine, of course, but I would say that some alternatives right now in the IAT. So the first one is, is the principalism, which is based on the idea that you have these five principles, including also like something like equity, equity, which will be probably justice people. I mean, we'll call it like in this way. And, and my impression is that that particular uh, um, uh, framework uh, can be useful for art regulation for informing like uh, uh, the development of laws and art regulation. But I mean, it doesn't provide much guidance to people who are actually doing the work in the AI realm. Because when you say something about equity, uh, then of course, then you will have a discussion. You must have a discussion about, about what equity is and how different people might understand equity. And, um, and so it seems that, that the, the, this particular approach, the principalism approach, uh, doesn't come, at least in the context of AI ethics, with the tools and instruments to provide that kind of discussion so that people might always find a way to realize their own version of equity in a way that is, let's say, ethically dubious. So, and in my case, in the case of, of the capability approach, um, I would say that in general, the capability approach, uh, it's, it is about, let's say, the substantial freedoms. So I think that it can also, let's say, equipped with uh, the tools to discuss things about equity and equality. And, um, and there can be actually, let's say, discussion about equity in trying to realize all of these or some of these, let's say, capabilities. And please know that all these capabilities, there are a lot of, let's say, works trying to characterize them, let's say, more concretely. So again, one will have just, let's say, to look at the, at the right literature. Then there is the second thing, which is, um, which is the value sensitive design approach, which is a slightly different approach. And, um, and it has been uh, uh, developed in the context of the ethics of technology. And it does provide concrete guidance uh, to practitioner on how, let's say, to embed certain kind of values into the design of technology. There is actually, let's say, a, a procedure which is, uh, which is very well developed and it can also be complementary to what we propose. The only problem is that it doesn't come with very strong idea about which value we should uh, we should include. And so it doesn't come with what philosopher would say with a normative perspective on which are the right values that we want to realize in the kind of technologies. While the capability approach come also, let's say, equipped with, um, with uh, a, normative, a normative perspective. So the realization of those uh, capabilities. And uh, in fact, there have been some people in the Netherlands uh, who have been trying, let's say, well, I mean, it was just one paper, but it was a very good paper that tried to, um, to integrate uh, the value sensitive design methodology, assume like it's been like a very value neutral method, paradoxically, with the capability approach. And I think it was like a very good result. And when it comes, let's say, to the other things that you were mentioning, I think that then again, like this, these 10, these 10 capabilities here, they, they also cover, as you, as you were saying, uh, they, they, they come, let's say, naturally to, so they, so they, they, they are, I think, goes pretty well with, with our approach. And consider that in our example of the, of the medical AI tool, we only focused on health capability for, matter, for, for, for the sake of simplicity. But in theory, I mean, if you have like more complex system in other contexts, then you might also want to consider other, other capabilities. Or you can also have, let's say, considerations, for instance, about, about the environment, which again, like controls over one's environment or other species, and the kind of things that we are doing to our planet uh, with uh, uh, these AI tools. So I don't know if that, let's say, answer or address some of so your comment. I mean, I would definitely ask, ask a follow up question, but I see Terry has a question in the um, in the chat, and maybe others have questions. Yeah. So Terry's question in the chat um, is, I am curious what the effects of different languages and interpretation of those languages and cultural values would have on the EBA 
And then would a more substantial EBA consider or audit across multiple cultural contexts, given that the conversion factors would be different? Yes, I mean, I mean, absolutely, absolutely, yes. So uh, I think I think that that's why that's why I'm I'm a, li a little bit less convinced that you can have an ethics based auditing that is external, like a company that is certified to do things in a particular way and audit things from an ethical perspective in a particular way. I I think that internal so ethics based auditing should be something internal to. Uh, to companies or corporations that they will hire their own, let's say, social scientists and ethicists in, in residence. And depending in the particular context in which the company is trying to develop products for, uh, depending which kind of country, then, then the ethicists and the social scientists will do the relevant research in order to understand what is the context in which we are trying to implement this AI tool. Because of course, if you have AI tools, medical AI tools, uh, that are developed in, I don't know, in the UK, then, and you want, let's say, to transfer them in a context like, I don't know, Nigeria or South Africa, then uh, likely, they, so the tool will not work in the way envisioned because, again, the, the environment will be completely different and so the conversion factors and so the end users. So, for instance, um, we have another, um, I have another project which is connected to this one uh, with, with social scientists and we are trying, let's say, to um, to investigate how uh, medical AI tools travel across different countries and, and how we can, we can make, let's say, this, this, um, this, this transfer of, of implementation context more responsible by looking at the conversion factors of the particular context in which something will be, uh, will be implemented. And I know we're almost out of time. I see Mildred has a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, can you hear me? Okay, uh, yes, I just wondered if, if you might say a little bit more about how, um, uh, your um, pointing to social scientists and ethicists as being the auditors in light of movements towards more broad public engagement or engaging other stakeholders in some of the important thing, you know, parts of the research process that you mentioned, such as problem formulation and all the way back at the beginnings. Yes, yes. I mean, um, if for instance, we are thinking about these internal audits done in the context of, I don't know, I have in mind uh, a big European project on medical AI, for instance, I'm, I'm, I'm part of this, of this consortium that is supposed, let's say to, develop this new standard for, for medical software. And that's a big project with 15 partners. And we are envisioning something like an internal audits along these lines, but we will have, of course, a lot of, let's say, stakeholder workshop also with, with relevant individuals who then will be direct and indirect stakeholders of this, of this technology, like, like, like patient group and things like that. And, and that will be something that, I mean, it would be, it would be the right thing to do. Uh, however, here I was thinking we were thinking more about maybe like a company that might not have, let's say, access to those particular, let's say, relevant stakeholder groups. And so I was thinking that maybe, maybe specifically, let's say, social scientists or ethicists might have the resources at least to anticipate some of the concern that stakeholders, various stakeholders group may have. But ideally, of course, it would be like this much more, let's say, participatory, uh, um, uh, uh, let's say, a procedure that you, that, you, that, so that you mentioned. The problem is that I'm not sure that people, that, that it's something feasible for every project. And, and I see that there are some companies now that they hire, let's say, AI ethicist. I'm not sure exactly what they are doing. It's unclear, I mean, at least to me. And um, so I think I think that maybe like companies might have resources to hire some of these people, but not maybe the resources to do, let's say, the bigger thing like for instance we are doing with this big European project. Thank you so much for your time today um, and for a fascinating uh, speech. And I'm sure we'll have actually much to discuss about this. Um, yeah. 
Thank you all for attending. Um, and we hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your month. We'll see you again uh, at the beginning of May for the next forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you for the questions.